Welcome, Ron. It's so fabulous to have you here. Oh, my gosh. Um, it was so kind of you to connect with me on LinkedIn and um, so fabulous to have you here because obviously in our uh, ecosystem, you've obviously achieved quite a lot with Prosper and uh, a great role model for a lot of uh, fintech entrepreneurs. So I wondered what actually led you into that? What was your passion that made you want to change um, the whole credit situation? Thank you. So it's first of all, great to be here. We're literally at the epicenter of the collision of fintech in the world. Here in San Francisco, within 100 miles from San Jose to San Francisco, where we're sitting right now, is that collision of Wall Street and the banking industry in Silicon Valley. How can you not be excited to be here? So for me, I was an early adopter in lending money in online lending platforms. And I saw the power of it as an investor who could lend money, get your money back, and get a return on your money in consumer loans, super prime, prime, near prime, and subprime, in student loans, consumer, small business, and real estate, and franchise loans. And this really was the beginning of the move from the sharing economy, where we just shared pictures and music, to the access economy, like Uber and Airbnb, but now for money. And so for me, it's early, maybe top of the second inning, and it's happening right here in front of us. It's fantastic um, because having someone like you in the Bay Area certainly gives a sense that we do have a fintech history and community because I know it's not as um, intense or powerful as New York where all the big banks are based. Um, so thank you so much. Tell me a bit about what Prosper does. So Prosper is a 10-year-old company. We're an online lender for consumers, for super prime and prime consumers. About two thirds of the consumers are doing debt consolidation. There's literally $1 trillion of outstanding consumer credit and much of it is priced incorrectly looking for a better experience. And then there's lots of people, super prime and prime consumers, who wanna do a large purchase or considered purchase like home improvement or medical, travel, and other purchase uh, procedures online. And we're able to find those people with a great experience and introduce them seamlessly online any time of the day to people and banks and other investors around the world who want to meet and lend and borrow. It's really one of the big things that's changing, not just in consumer lending, but really how we save and how we invest, how we move money and transfer money. It's all changing and it's all coming together with the same premise. We're doing some things new in FinTech, but in a lot of cases, we're doing things much better, more improved, quicker with a better experience. But we're working with the incumbents, the incumbent financial institutions, banks and insurance companies, and the incumbent technology companies. It's not us or them, it's all of us together making this happen. Definitely, um, it is a community. And I, I like to, um I like the fact that you're talking about the incumbents. How has it been for you in this 10 years with the incumbent banks, big banks? So in the beginning, it really was we were too small. They didn't really care. Then in phase two, they did care, and they sent their innovation teams to us to learn and ask questions. Wow. And now we're in phase three, where the top of the house, the CEOs and the CFOs and the very senior people are coming to us. And the banks are looking to buy loans, be a vendor to us, have us power their online solution, buy us or copy us and do the same thing. And some FinTech companies are buying banks or becoming banks. So you see this very, very interesting time today. But it's not like they don't know who we are. They like what we're doing, not just in credit, and in underwriting and pricing, but in verification, in ways we use the online services to find the borrowers and fund the borrowers in the marketplace. We have banks who've invested in the equity of Prosper and many banks who buy loans from us. It just works. Would you be able to tell me a little, um, a little bit about, because you're actually made it through to phase three, most FinTech startups, always a start small, everyone starts small. So what was the secret sauce that you can look back on and say, this was the secret ingredient that helped you become from a small startup 
to now being a huge marketplace and having the attention of the big banks. What was that secret sauce? That's a great question. I actually was asked that same question at UC Berkeley this morning with oh. the MBA students. <laughs> so think about Prosper. It's a 10-year-old company. It took eight years in aggregate to do $1 billion of loans. It then took six months to do the second $1 billion, and now just a quarter to do a billion. And so we've done $9 billion in our history, but it took so long. And I think the competition for early fintechs is not each other. It's not the tech companies and the incumbents. It's something we call E, A, and U, which is education, awareness, and understanding. It's getting the people and the businesses to understand we're here. There's a new solution, a better solution, a faster solution. And on the liability side, on the capital side, to bring the venture capitalists and the debt capital to fund the online lending programs. It's a combination of educating and making aware and understanding the benefits of what we're doing to everybody, the regulators and the fin and tech community, the money and the borrowers. So something I'm fascinated with because I have a strong um, VC network is uh, why the Silicon Valley investors have been slow to the party um, with fintech. Um, that has uh, given benefits to the community here, so it's quite a, a strong, thick community. But um, I'm just wondering what you see, because many people tell me different reasons for this, this happening. So I have worked with many of the VC companies also, and I also have invested in 16 other fintech companies around the world. Wow. And entrepreneurs need to explain in a very articulate way, without saying the words, um, I mean, yeah, you like, and no, <laughs> what is the value proposition? What differentiates you? Are you building a 100-year company? How does, the, how does this get profitable? What are the key performance indicators? What are the objectives and key results? How are you going to execute? What are you going to do with the money? Why is it that the incumbents can't crush you? How are you going to compete and evolve and pivot? And if an entrepreneur can't articulate each of these in a crisp, distinct way in just a matter of 15 or 20 minutes, the VCs in general don't give the money. It takes a special entrepreneur to convince that VC or PE firm to give the money. These venture capitalists have seen every pitch deck, every chart, every graph up to the right. They're really looking for an entrepreneur with grit and skin in the game and a vision and the ability to attract talent and execute. It looks easy like yoga, but it's actually very hard. It definitely doesn't look easy like yoga. Um, and I, I've always uh, thought that a lot of startups in Silicon Valley, uh, obviously startups come, startups go, it's a moving population all the time, um, that people don't pay enough attention to the engagement in a pitch. Now, I can see just from our conversation and feel you engage um, with what you say, whether it's something you've learned, but you're still engaging with the human being. Um, do you think that that's, a, that that's my theory, that, that that's an important issue when you pitch to a, a VC? Would you agree with that or would you want to elaborate? I think engagement is critical. So a great entrepreneur, I mean a truly great one, who's passionate and has a vision and is really committed to it, the FinTech solution, can take a medium or great idea and make an enormous impact and a great profitable 100-year company. But if the entrepreneur isn't really engaged, isn't really all in and aligned with the business and the investors, even a mediocre entrepreneur with a great idea, it doesn't work. And so there's so much about our IQ and our EQ, our intelligence quotient and that emotional quotient, to see and feel nonverbal communication. And I think those VCs can see right through the entrepreneur, into their brain, how big is the horsepower, but really what's happening inside that entrepreneur. And the entrepreneur has to really, really differentiate themselves to get that VC to write that first check and the second and the third. And of course, um, there's a lot of uh, the VCs are investing other people's money in a in a startup. So obviously, there's got to be a sense of um, authenticity and trust um, in that person. So not only engagement, but some sense of um, substance within the human being. Um, would you agree with that? 
I do. I, I often meet entrepreneurs, and when I find that entrepreneur with conviction and the sparkle in their eye, who's had some issue in their life that they've been able to get around or over or under, someone who's seen the challenges, made the pivot, or has the ability to ask the questions how to get through the pivot, that's really what entrepreneurship's about. It is not a straight line. The highs are high and the lows are low, and they can be on the same day. And it's really about that person and their ability to deal with it, get through it, and then show up. I just gave a speech in Paris three weeks ago, and I compared us fintech entrepreneurs to Rocky Balboa because he trained and he answered the bell and he got hurt and he recovered and he was resilient. Even if you don't win, you have to be standing in the 12th round and go through each of the cycles and pivots of entrepreneurship. And I think that's what venture capitalists are looking for, is that entrepreneur who's going to answer the bell, take the pain, pivot, and get to the final round and hope for the win. True grit, hey? Agree, yes. <laughs> Tell me, do you have a funny story in your, in your career that something that's happened to you that would um, help lighten and finish the interview? So the funny story that happened to me today is I was talking to these MBA students at Berkeley, and I told them that I went to Berkeley in 1982, and none of them were born yet. So for me, I realized exactly how old I really am today. It was quite funny. <laughs> well, I, it's funny in a good way, though, right? <laughs> so um, because I'm sure that that 1982... Uh, boy is still within you right now, right? He really is. I've actually been uh, joked and called the Tom Brokaw of the industry in <laughs> fintech and in online lending, which again shows how old I am. But really, I'm trying to be that chief storyteller to tell about the opportunity and the challenges and the reality, but how early we are, not just in North America, but in the Middle East and Europe and South America and for sure in Asia. There's so much going on. What a great time, not just to be in San Francisco, but really to be in fintech. Well, you're a wonderful role model, and thank you so much for your contribution tonight. I'm so looking forward to this panel. Thank you for including me.